the Transpennine Route of Grade West Alliance. And we've got Sarah. Um, yeah, we'll be talking to you today about the Transpennine Route Upgrade. So it's essentially a lot of you will know the project. It's a it's a it's a big project. It's been underway for a few years now. Um, it's essentially transforming rail between uh, York and uh, Manchester. Um, I'm involved on the uh, mainly involved on the the part between Leeds and uh, Manchester. Um, so essentially, it's it's new tracks, stations. Um, uh, greener, faster, more reliable railway. So a few a few points to note on the slide deck and nice um, nice renders of the uh, Ravenslot viaduct, which we're currently building. Uh, essentially, you see there it's, it's got now four lines. Currently, it's got um, up, down, slow. It's got it's going to have a up, down, fast, and slow, um, fully electrified. So just a couple of really nice pictures of assets. Something that's already been dropped into place on the photo on the right is um, a new footbridge at Batley. Uh, it's a new metallic bridge which has gone in and it's closed a um, level crossing in a residential area. So really nice piece of um, infrastructure already embedded, um, um, already people using that um, and the uh, level crossing, uh, the pedestrian level crossing is now closed. Um, we're an alliance. Um, I work for Bam Nuttall. Um, there's also Arup, Amy, um, and Siemens. So Bam Nuttall are doing the civils part, the um, heavy earthworks and all the civils. Amy are doing the um, rail systems uh, truck, um, mostly things within the um, rail footprint. And um, we've got Siemens doing the SBNC. Um, so it's an alliance, so work collaboratively. Um, we'll will be a little bit of a civils bias on these slides, but hopefully we'll try and capture some of the good work done across the piece. Um, so today, um, a little bit about the session. You've probably seen the uh, synopsis, um, a little bit on rail and um, about the assurance that we've been doing on the job. So a lot about construction assurance. Hopefully you can see some of the good work we've been doing, a few of the lessons. Um, and we've got, uh, we've got Sarah and Amy um, looking at the integrations piece. So actually getting the railway back into the network, which is uh, essentially the bit which gets it going again. Um, so a little bit about me, based in Leeds. Um, I'm the senior quality manager at BAM Nuttall and TIU West. So that's the civils piece. And I've been in post um, since 2022, so about 18 months. Um, I've done a little, so my background is not civils. So it's quite well for a few years now i've been working in civils but quite a lot of mechanical so a lot of oil and gas um so maybe a little bit of a different take to a few of you on the call um i'm currently completing my civils design and construction transport infrastructure at university of leeds but i also hold a postgraduate diploma in development management um my career is across infrastructure oil and gas a little bit in aerospace fm um renewables as well so offshore wind so a little bit of a, uh, a mix. So I've seen plenty of different industries, different methodologies. Um, currently doing some research around the um, proactive design for quality. So how we actually look at constructability in seeing a uh, constructible piece of quality in rail, which is uh, which is essentially being assured from, from start to finish and is a little bit easier to build as a result. Um, I'm the Deputy Secretary at the uh, Constru Construction Special Interest Group, so the CONSIG at the Chartered Quality Institute, and I'm also an accredited Get It Right uh, GIRI trainer, um, which is something that we're rolling out uh, on TIU, and uh, so far getting good reception. Um, hand over to Sarah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sarah Padmark. I am the Integration Project Manager for the Transparent Route Upgrade. Um, I specifically work um, on the Huddersfield area at the minute. Um, I am Manchester based with my office, but I do travel for work. Um, my experience is I've got a, a postgrad award in strategic leadership um, and I have a science degree in sport and exercise sciences. Um, I work on program delivery and major programs at the minute. I'm a chartered professional with the Association of Project Management and I'm also a full member. Um, my railway career is relatively young. I've only been working here for seven years. Um, I do have a great many years working elsewhere. 
um, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say. Um, but I am also a guest presenter, uh, or have been a guest presenter for a couple of years at the Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, I'm a guest committee member for the Association of Project Management in the Northwest Branch. And I'm also a regular standing guest in lecturer for the University of Manchester, um, lecturing their Mechanical, Aerospace and Civil Engineering Department. I've been doing that for about five years now. I'll pass over to Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Young. I'm a project management assistant for the integration team on Transplant and Route Upgrade. Um, I'm even younger than Sarah. I've only been with Network Rail and Transplant and Route Upgrade for a year and a half, um, but it's been a great project to join. Um, there's scope to learn. So it's a really exciting project. Um, and yeah, it's been a good year and a half so far, and hopefully it'll continue. Thank you. So we jump into the uh, meat of the slides. So the first bit I wanted to cover off really is the um, we've titled it Understanding Readiness and Assurance of Rail. I wanted to put in the context of the Transpennine route upgrade because it is it, it is a tricky job. It's um, it's a large transport infrastructure project. Um, it's rural um, and it's also urban and we're doing it as an alliance um, and we're doing it as an alliance with Network Rail. Um, which has its pros and cons. It's good to be working directly with the integrator and it's good that we've got the uh, expertise from the different participants. It's a massive project so we're trying to do things in a way which means we can share that learning across the piece but at the same time it's difficult to get standardization and we sometimes have to question is that standardization required in all the areas that we have it. It's quite a diverse project as well. We've got a lot of different um, ground profiles, we've got a lot of different communities, we've got different um, ages of infrastructure. Um, you've got a nice picture of here of a bridge deck getting put into place and you know that 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 those are the great results that we like to see. These are the big ticket results. We can see a nice metallic deck in green going in. It's really good work. Uh, but to get to there there's 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 you know there's a lot of engineering complexity. Um, touched on the uh, the topography we're going across the Pennines, it's wet, um, it's hilly, it's difficult to build. I mean, the Victorians built a railway there and we've got, we're going back and we're doing an upgrade and we're seeing the same challenges that presumably they saw. Um, so we, we're having to do it, uh, we'll touch on it a lot later, but, but you know, we have to do it in a way which is um, sympathetic to the landscape, to the communities, to our neighbours. So we have to build in a way which is um, going to create the limited, uh, the least amount of disruption we can. And we have to do it on cost. Um, so all these challenges which we're sort of looking at, I know, you know, I hear you that these are challenges that we see in all big infrastructure projects. We're seeing it in an area where we've not really done a large upgrade for, for a while in rail, um, and it comes with its own challenges. Um, one of the main challenges that we're seeing at the moment is around the, in the civils context, is around the, um, uh, we'll touch on it a little bit later, but around uh, concrete. Um, you know, these are these are problems that we see in, in infrastructure projects in general, um, but it just feels a little bit more painful at the moment, but I think we're getting to the other side of it and it's one of the points I'll touch on later that in an alliance it's good because we can share that learning and it's good having network rail on board as a participant because we can hopefully share that learning wider than um, than just this uh, this project. So I'll touch now on a little bit on the sort of general importance of rail infrastructure projects because we talk about assurance, we talk about quality and we it's to me it's a little bit more than just sort of doing inspection test plans and check sheets. So I think that the 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 impacts of quality on large scale projects uh, Quality is important whether or not you're doing a, you know, a, a, a small domestic project or, or doing a large infrastructure project like what we've got here. But the the impact is probably felt a little bit more if you if you've got systematic problems which have been repeated again and again and again, especially on the linear line. So we've seen impacts of quality on transparent route grade. We've also seen the positive lessons learned that we get out of sort of re remediating that and sort of eliminating those errors. Um, we're doing it sort of in full exposure of the client, which which presents you know an opportunity to show that we've got a methodology which works, which I think is positive. And hopefully we can get some legacy learning out of this job. We, we are delivering work 
to a good quality on the whole. You see here the nice picture from uh, Molly Station. That's with work in progress. If you go through there now, it looks fantastic. You know, you can you can see that 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 station has really come together. It's had its challenges. I'll go through a few lessons from that station, but the impact of quality on large scale projects is, you know, it can be huge. Um, there's all the things that come with it, with reputation, etc. Um, quality can lead to cost saving and efficiency. So when you're doing work again and again, obviously it costs more money. Um, I go back to the uh, Giri learning, there's plenty of get it right initiative learning out there. Circa 20% of work in construction is, is, is you know, cost free work. Essentially, we're seeing a fifth of work um, redone at, at cost. So there's, there's an opportunity there to save quite a bit of money and average profits. I don't have an exact number of what profit margins are in uh, rail um, uh, construction but they're a lot less than 20%. So there's real opportunities there on that. Um, cost of poor quality, so rework is expensive. It's also more dangerous. If you've got a construction methodology, you plan to build something one way and you have to go back and do the work a different way. It wasn't designed to be constructed that way. It's more costly, uh, more dangerous. It's um, It costs time, it costs reputation. Um, and um, the ripple effects as well, essentially, People do tend to take pride in their work. You know, I take pride in my work. Most people take pride in their work. But if you have good quality, it breeds good quality. You can see the good quality and then other operatives of the designers can see that that's then the benchmark. It sets a local standard and that's positive. Um, and we've, we'll get into a little bit more detail a little bit later, but but these are the initiatives that we've been putting into place in Transpan and Rube Code. And I think the communication that we've been able to do um, around these has been really positive. So quality assurance in rail infrastructure, so the meat of the slides really. So I've put down on the left hand side here quite a few of the assurance mechanisms that we see in rail. I mean, most of you will be familiar with these um, rail jobs like acronyms. So if you um, are new to the rail industry, I can provide plenty of jargon busters, but DWWP, DDRs, AMP, integration, um, engineering assurance, construction assurance, IOC. There's loads of different uh, assurance mechanisms we use. And when we put construction uh, quality into a job, we tend to separate that. Um, there's, pl there's plenty of good legacy learning out on rail projects. I mean, there's a whole library from um, Crossrail. Um, and you know that that's a large project where you know they have their pros and cons as well but essentially they've been through been through they've been through the pain so i think when we set up rail infrastructure projects it's important to not reinvent the wheel um rail has useful mechanisms for doing assurance and um as sort of somebody coming into the rail industry over the last few years it it it, it appears it's apparent that sometimes these mechanisms tend to work in separation a little bit but really they're all uh, they're coming to the same end. They all want a good quality product and they all want it to be produced at the right time, the right safety, uh, the right cost, and to be handed back and put into service at the right time and in a good way. And it's it's maintainable for the future. So I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that in rail, potentially there's opportunity to have a more holistic um, I guess, collective memory of what's happening with assurance, because things have happened in the recent past, in the previous decades that we can put in to learning when we've set up new rail jobs. Um, and that's positive learning that, you know, when, when we've set up TransPennine route of grade, we've looked to these previous, um, uh, these previous problems that have been seen in rail and in wider construction and in other industries. And I would hope that we've implemented some of those so uh, Sarah and Amy will get into a little bit more detail, but the, the work that's been going on with AMP and integrations to put put something in place where we can hand a good quality product over is, is huge. And, you know, it's successful. We'll get into some of the successes a little bit later on that. Um, so readiness and assurance is multidisciplinary, is collective. So I'm speaking to you from a civil perspective, but what is apparent is that that, you know, these assurance mechanisms are working across the different disciplines. So I think there's an opportunity to bring those disciplines together. And we do that in IDCs, IDRs, but, but 
we need to find mechanisms to make sure that that it's happening across the, the piece. So it's not just having those conversations at set stages. It's, you know, early contractor engagement. It's having the construction managers present when you make those decisions. It's really important to have CEMs involved in quality conversations. Um, and as we've been focusing on that at TIU, we, we see positive results. I mean, we've seen some defects which should have been prevented, but I would hope that now we're having conversations where we are learning from that. Um, another point I was going to make on this slide is that there's a lot of different standards and we are upskilling a workforce and transparent route upgrade is, is no different to a lot of the big infrastructure projects. We're upskilling people completely competent, really knowledgeable, but new to rail. And I think that that in terms of the standards, the 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 rail industry can be quite um, it's got a it's got a high complexity of standard requirements. Um, I, you know, it's comparable with highways, but but this is all information which needs to be learned as an organisation. Um, I think. One of the lessons that we've seen from Transpennine is that if we can manage to put a mechanism in place where our workforces and our teams understand the holistic picture of all the assurance standards together, then we're in a good space to to be able to construct something to a high quality and safely. Um, so in terms of, um, there's one other point I was going to make on here as well, is that you can do the quality and you can engineer uh, but there will always be a um, a need for a level one and level two assurance. So that level one and two, two assurance can look different in loads of different contexts, but it's important to make sure that that's put in place from an early stage. And where we've seen um, things labelled as supervision, etc., there's an opportunity there to 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 make sure that we've got that surveillance in place. So a few lessons from the quality. That we've seen on Transpennine. So Morley Station here is really uh, um, looking really good. Um, I've go through here a few times a week, and it's looking really positive. And I was speaking to the CEM uh, the other week. It's a really great job. Um, there's a few really positive learnings from this job. Is that that you know there's really good contract constructor engagement quite early on, which was um, which was positive, and it led to um essentially the the workmanship in a lot of areas was really good and it, it uh, additionally the um there's qu good quality engineer engagement so having the quality engineers involved with the hand back records at an early stage was really important and it led to uh being able to get the records in for the health and safety file which is also really important um proactive use of the form e's so quite good um, um, conversations in producing the form E's. So I think that's another part of the assurance process, which I didn't touch on previously, but it paints that picture of, of it needs to be cohesive in order to have good quality outcomes. It's not just about a quality team uh, working in a silo. Um, I wanted to go through, I know it's a bit of a wordy slide, but each of these is, is, is meaningful, I think. Um, the supply chain, so, BAM Nuttall are, are really competent in heavy civils. Um, in the BAM group of companies as BAM Riches, for example, who Earthworks is their, you know, it's their bread and butter. It's really important to have tier twos working closely with the tier ones, working closely with client or internal participant. Um, there, there could be processes in place where, where um, those learnings are spread up and down. Um, and it's important to have that early doors. So a strategic approach to, um, uh, to to the commercial schedule is really important there. Progressively compiling health and safety files. Um, one of the learnings that we've seen is that quite often when you start putting health and safety files together, you can end up um, pushing the health and safety compilation a little bit further to the right. And then it ends up being um, the critical path for for later handback. So if you can progressively compile, that's also your quality records to an extent. So engagement with the SCREs early on. So having that in your schedule, uh, or having it in a schedule, is really important. And um, some of you will know about the um, new standard that's coming into compliance for for health and safety files, which will mean that we'll have to hand hand those back a little bit sooner. Um, Work off-site suppliers, so accelerated construction and off-site construction. So in terms of precast concrete, metallics, 
work with them closely. There's a lot of expertise out there. Have those conversations, have those conversations between designers and tier ones and tier twos to make sure that 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 uh, that work is handed back. I know a lot of designs are quite modular, but there's still opportunities to be had in constructability. And we've seen plenty of um, instances where where um, good uh, good and bad examples of that working on on transparent root upgrade. Um, engineering construction should work together. So they complement each other essentially. Engineering um, and design are trying to make a constructible product and it's been very successful where we've seen that interaction. Um, and cross-discipline learning, I mean, on this job I've learned a lot more about track than, you know, I'm not necessarily always doing track, but I've learned a lot about track to, to the extent where I feel comfortable to have quality conversations with track experts. I think that's really important because that's, that's adding to the industry. Um, demonstratable practical expertise in quality. So there's a place for uh, knowledge over many, many years in quality. There's also, you know, there's also a really strong case for upskilling younger members of staff to ensure that they have those skills for quality. Um, if you've seen problems in the in, in the past, you, you're more likely to recognise them in the future. Getting it right first time, which we touched on. Um, celebrating good quality because we always complain about bad quality, but there's a there's something to be said there. And the uh, positive correlation between senior leadership and presence and quality. So have safety walkouts, have quality walkouts. It's really positive. Um, importance of pausing when something's not right and giving people the opportunity to have a no go. And the um, the place of an inspection test plan, make sure it's approved by the right people and make sure it's used progressively and demonstrated. I mean, it's, it, it, for a lot of people working in the rail industry, it's, this is not new, it's just a reiteration because we've seen examples of where it goes wrong and it didn't quite go right. And again, that quality must not look inwards, but outwards. It's there to, it's an enabler. I had a little bit that I wanted to add sort of on the future of the bits that we've been doing on, on TransPennine. So a few, few slides here. So around um, uh, BIM. So obviously, you know, most of you will have seen BIM and digital twins, but we, we, it's really just about the proactive use of it because we, the industry is at a maturity. Um, rail is different to other industries. It's different to nuclear and the oil and gas in that, that we're working with an old infrastructure. Um, the interfaces might not always have good data. Well, you know, I'm sure Brunel didn't have BIM. Um, federated models can be difficult. Um, I think that the, what we're going to get out here is that use the tools that are available to you and try to upskill. Where we've seen successful implementation on 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 uh, Transpennine, uh, Bamnatol, Amy, you know, we've got digital tools available um, that 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 are, where used, it's really positive. You can see that proactive uh, assurance happening. Um, there might still be a place for paper. The important the important point is to make sure that you've got that progressive assurance and digital tools are good for that. It's a good way of engaging the supply chain. If you've got your tier twos, try and get them set up with the right models, try and get those interfaces, try and have something a little bit more seamless than um, just the very, very basic common data environment where we've seen good interaction. We've seen good clash detection. We've seen good identification of uh, utilities. And I think that that that's that's a really important takeaway from um, from TransPennine. We've got really good digital construction. Have a Google search. There's some really good examples on TransPennine. I think that's really benefited the uh, quality positively. Um, there was one other point I was going to make actually on, on BIM is that um, if you consider a digital twin to be essentially a um, a a record of something which is happening in time and space um it's essentially makes a really compelling case case for quality because you've got your records already there it shows that 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 something happened at a moment in time and that activity can be demonstrated so future opportunities i'll uh, take up a lot of time so i'll quickly go over the future opportunities something which is quite um compelling i think in in construction the use of um, concrete and where we're going next with concrete because we've been doing concrete in quite a similar way for a long period of time and we do reception quality for concrete most frequently there's plenty of ways of assuring concrete 
and if we can find to a, a way to assure concrete in process reliably across the um, across the industry then we can find a way of using less concrete there's a lot of uncertainty there's a lot of design factor in concrete if we could find a way of assuring concrete better then we could use less concrete and there's a compelling sustainability argument for that um, 3d printing this isn't on rail it's on a uh, on a construction job but essentially if you've got a um, uh, these are stairs in in the for the, the Bamnotos client was the Glasgow City Council and there was no uh, these are 3d printing stairs in concrete so there's no shuttering there's obviously a material gain there and it's a little bit more bionic in its construction so it's a lot less material it's, it's compelling but it also presents quality issues uh, quality detectability issues it's more difficult to detect issues with quality uh, through through new methodologies there's less uh, detectable methodologies out there um, on the bottom right but essentially carbon emissions rework is carbon we've got targets we need to do less rework that's, that's the bottom line essentially and the get it right initiative uh we're seeing positive gains in the get it right initiative it's engaging the complete operative workforce in in um removing error and we've seen positive gains on transpen and already even through conversations with leadership on that um so it, it's you know the future is bright for quality i think it's just how we how we handle it in transport infrastructure in general i think there's opportunity there but the next steps uh, the next projects will have you know have to actively look at the past and see 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 how we iterate that um i'll pass over to sarah sarah and amy hi thanks sam um, OK, so I'm going to look at a holistic approach to readiness and quality, and this is a slightly different perspective on it. So I'm, I'm obviously not a freeway engineer or an engineer and project manager. Um, but what we do try and do is help the teams get there in the best way possible. So I am going to try and do this justice and apologies if I don't, but uh, I'll certainly try. So I am part of the integration team and it's a very tough team to try and explain because no one really knows what we do. Um, it's a word that's funded around as a thing to integrate and then obviously our team is called this as well. So um, let me try. So why are we critical in what we do? And just to pull out some of the key things, um, basically we are, I think someone described us as the glue that holds us together the other day, which was quite interesting. Um, I like to think of myself as an interpreter. Uh, so interpreting the information coming in and out at different levels to get to different teams. So if I've got directors talking to me, the language is very different to the, the agents and the site teams that I'll go out and sit in the cabins with. So an interpreter between the disciplines as well as between the different levels within the organisation or within the alliance. A um, bit of a problem solver. Don't know how I've got that title, but um, I do like a good problem and I do try and find a pragmatic way of approaching it. As I said earlier, my railway career is quite young. Uh, my career prior to that was largely health, education and transport in various different means. Um, I'm used to dealing with people, so getting around people and getting to understand their ways and means and, and constraints in their thought process is quite interesting to me. So it's increasing that diversity of thought and getting them to think outside of that box or that linear railway line. So um, there is that which you need to be able to communicate. And whilst everyone's a little bit tense with presentations. Um, I do find that I have a very good relationship with the team out on site as well as the ones in the office and we quite often if not all the time come to a pragmatic solution that is best for program and is also the safest way that we can deliver it as well. A lot of stakeholder management within that as you can imagine um, and the main thing for us is entry into service so we are accountable for entering into service as my team. Um, so part of getting there is um, industry readiness. So while we have to be ready, uh, the delivery teams, the design needs to be on the table. We also need a lot of help in getting there as well. So our schedule for access, um, which is planned railway closures, we don't get them because some of us work for network rail um, or because the boss is asking. We have to plan that in and it is years in the planning. Um, I've just finished doing part of the box plan development for the next four years and it takes a lot to get to that point, especially when you know there's there's a likelihood of change and a bit of movement in that programme. 
Um, haulage requirements for ICO colleagues are on board as well. So we obviously need to work that around not only our requirements, but the rest of the country. So that resource is moving up and down to facilitate a number of works and we are not the only project on the network. Um, alternative transport arrangements. So again, bus replacement services seems really trivial in the grand scheme of things when you think it's a, it's a £10 billion programme worth of works that we're doing and we're worried about the bus service. Well, we are worried about the bus service because our passengers need to get from A to B. We want them to use the new rail service that we're putting in place. Um, so all of that needs to be given thought and it goes down to the impact on that as well. So how are we impacting our passengers and the local residents in the area, the businesses, anyone who gets an income from that? It's it's an ever evolving piece of work and a level of cognizance needs to be given there throughout everything that we do. Um, and stakeholder engagement and management is so broad ranging, but the best type of stakeholder engagement um, that I get involved in, and again, it comes down to that problem solving element, is it comes down to the access, it's the talks, it's the fox, um, it's looking at our DFT coming out and saying, what do they want to see, keeping them updated, the ORRs out, what are they interested in from a technical perspective, that kind of stuff really engages me. Um, and I get excited and I get involved in all of those things and take them out and point and show and try and demonstrate a little bit of engineering know-how uh, when I'm out there, but that's under the assumption that I may may know a little bit more than someone else. Um, so the way that we get that industry readiness piece together as well, it's something that's evolved from uh, the initial part of the project, uh, which that I was on, and some of you may have heard, we closed Daily Bridge for a significant amount of time earlier in the year, so that was my project. Um, but on the back of all of that, and looking at where we are now and how big the programme of work is that's left to deliver, the uh, there is now an enterprise model in place, and that is inclusive of the DFT and SCO. So we are now a huge cog in this machine that's turning to deliver this work. It's not just the alliance that sits within it. We do have other parties in there to help make decisions and get to that point of best programme approach um, and making sure we're delivering on our promises for our partners and our passengers. Um, engineering entry into service readiness, so that whilst this is an engineering standard, um, it is also a service that is provided. So again, the team under integrations banner is wholly accountable for this as well. So we have to help target this um, based on lessons learned and what we implemented on the pre previous project, which was known as W1. And we put entry into service leads in place. So I was the entry into service lead for what was called stage C. Uh, we're now working on stages G through to O, so there's nine stages left to do. It worked quite well. Whilst we are an alliance, everything's done by committee, and we need someone to help steer and make best programme decisions and direct and, and navigate through the, the muddy waters, basically, because, again, when, when you do do things by committee, not everyone's willing to put their hand up first and make that decision. So we have a very objective view. We get all the facts. We have a discussion with everybody involved, and then we finalise that agreement with everybody, but we're, we're quite good at teasing that out and getting to that end point. So we, we do well there. Um, aligning expectations. So again, that goes through stakeholders, but also goes internally. So we have different, as Tom said earlier, different organisations form this alliance and the supply chain partners that sit underneath it. I think there's about 20 of them. So to try and align the whole alliance to work towards the same goal is, is not only difficult, um, but but it's also intense. So part of what we're doing now is we're currently going under audit to go into the next tranche of funding. And one of the questions we're asked was, well, can you not do your PDRs so everyone's got the same objectives? And the reality is, no, we can't. Everyone still needs to satisfy their parent organisation requirements, whether that be training um, or, or mandated, mandated training, safety courses, um, whether oh. they need to do things in a certain way and fill out the certain pro formas, then we need to respect that as well. So that there is a balance to be had there, but the expectations definitely need to be aligned uh, and managed all the way through. Um, looking for efficiency in delivery. Again, finding that opportunity when we work with the delivery teams, especially in, in set disciplines, you can see that the you know, track looking at track, civils looking at civils, signaling a look at signaling and EMP and so on. But do they see that overall picture? And, and it's not always clear to see because you're so far into the detail. And again, we, we provide that umbrella so we can look for the opportunity um, and, and we can find where things will one mesh together, work on site, 
optimise in possession so we've got minimal disruption where possible and making sure we get the best out of what we've got to deliver uh, and demonstrating our charter values in everything that we do. So again, it's a bit of hearts and minds, that kind of approach. But at the end of the day, the charter is not just about being honest and transparent and caring for each other. It's about challenge and making sure that we have got the right people in the right job to make the right decisions and keep people safe out on site. So it is, again, a balance to be had. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The delivering work within possessions, another standard you may have heard of. Um, we are, again, accountable for ensuring adherence to that. And we have KPIs. So whilst, you know, most of the team that I work in work for Network Rail. We are not wholly a Network Rail team. We are classed as the owner participant, but we do have people from the other not, so the non-owner participants that work within our team as well. Um, regardless of who their parent company is, if you're sat under the integration banner, you're accountable for delivering the standard and making sure we adhere to it. It's a KPI within the contract. We're on a pain gain contract and we sit with the other alliance partners as part of that. So if one person feels pain, we all feel pain. Um, so it is fair. Um, and how do we as integration improve assurance around delivery? So a couple of points, because I could go on forever. Um, <laughs> access, possession, integration, and construction, construction stage in meetings. These are three meetings that have over the last six weeks, I've worked with some individuals to evolve these. So the biggest thing we have is we've got so much access and so much work to do. How do we get people into it and doing it in a safe manner? We have had instances where we've got access, we'll just use that one, but it's not integrated. And, and that's the key thing. It needs to be integrated in a programme and um, in the way that we deliver that. So the process that we're currently uh, completing at the minute in terms of reference are, are being finalised is the access request. You need, to act, you need to request to go into that access because if you are, it's likely to be changed because we've just done the box plan with all of it in. Possession integration gives high level deconfliction. Um, so you can run those details and make sure it, it kind of works on paper and construction staging is going into the detailed delivery deconfliction. So we're looking at how many people have you got on site? Where are you accessing? What is the haulage situation? Are they coming east to west? What are the timings? Where is everybody? What lifts have we got? And it goes down to the nitty gritty detail. Now I'm involved in that entire process. Um, and the construction staging specifically is something that I implemented on the W1 project. Um, and we have since been asked to to revitalize it for W3. Um, so we are doing just that. So we've 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 revamped it. Um, we've pulled it in line with the access and the possession integration meetings that I also attend and co-chair in some instances, and it works very well. So it gives us the stages of how we get to that point of detail to enable a robust program, a QS array that shows we are safe, we are in time, and that we don't need to rush the guys and girls out on site. Um, so again, it's one of those lessons learned. We were asked for it and, we, and we've brought it back. The asset management plan, again, another standard you'll all be aware of, although it misses some or not. So this is something that we are also accountable for. Um, so whilst we're accountable for a lot of these, we're not responsible for doing all the doing. Um, the, the AMP process is something that's it's not always well adhered to for various reasons. Um, and we've tried to combat that. Again, a lesson learned, a lot of pain felt. Um, we have decided on the back of that to be proactive and try and move forward. So I have produced uh, and implementing at the minute, it's under process, um, an AMP and data process to support the existing standard so it doesn't replace it. But what it does do is aligns to the alliance. The standard is fit for a conventional delivery. It is not fit for a major program of multi-billion pounds worth of delivery. So we've written the process to enable those who do complete the forms to fill them out sufficiently. Um, we have created data flows. Um, and we have inboxes, et cetera, single points of contact throughout. We're just going to make it a little bit easier for people to understand how to get from point A to point B. And it aids in that compliance. We must be compliant. These are safety based standards that we must adhere to. And we want to be safe in our delivery um, and, and have a compliant handback. So the AMP process is a really good example. And Amy's going to go into more detail in that in a short while. Um, but the legacy for me in all of what we do, and, and we hear it all the time, is everyone home safe every day, and, and, and that's great. But quite often we think about that 
in um, in the context of the workforce going to site, doing what they need to do, and then going home safe to their families at the end of their shift. For me, it's a little bit more than that. So my question is, are people still going home safe in 10, 20, 60 years time? So has the infrastructure we have built standing the test of the time? Is the design assured enough to stand that test of the time? And is it still doing what it's supposed to be doing? So as people still going home safe every day, that person just changes along that journey, whether it be the workforce or the passenger. But at the end of the day, everyone still needs to get there. I am going to hand over to Amy, who's going to go into one of these in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Um, so yeah, as Sarah said, the AMP standard is built for standard renewals within the network rail business. And on a complex project like this, it becomes challenging to uh, make sure we're adhering to the standard and complying. Um, so this process was developed on the back of lessons learned earlier on in the project. Uh, earlier on in the project is between Manchester, Victoria and Staley Bridge. Um, they're the earlier phases. And it just details how information flows and forms a pass through from construction through to integration and onwards to our asset owners and maintainers. Um, it's a very clear flow. A lot of uh, the NOPs and people within the Alliance have been seeing the standard before. Um, so it's like a simple guide and helps us comply. Uh, this was also developed in collaboration with our maintainers, uh, both in Manchester and Leeds. Um, it just creates that level of confidence that the project is delivering and communicating any change, installation or recoveries on the network rail infrastructure. Project of this size has a high volume of work. This means a high volume of, volume of forms going to different asset owners, whether that be rail, geotechnic, structures. With that, there's a lot of email back and forth for signatures. As part of the process, we implemented a single point of contact, which they're a reference. Um, so for the West Alliance, we have a generic inbox where all correspondence and all forms get sent. This prevents any delays with individuals from the integration team being off. It also makes it easy for construction to email that if they have any queries regarding AMPs. And likewise for our stakeholders, so asset owners and maintainers, they can email that and somebody within the integration team will pick that up. It promotes efficiency as well. And similarly, uh, the delivery unit in Leeds has also got a generic inbox. So it's a single point of contact again, and it's a lot more, it's a little easier to communicate between project and our stakeholders. As part of creating an efficiency as well. We've implemented the use of NitroSign, which is a digital signature software. And this helps with assurance as well. It can track signatures. You have a number of signatures that need to be signed on each AMP form. It creates an audit trail and it's very easy for people to see where a form's stuck and it won't get lost in an inbox. The AMP standard follows a project from identifying the scope all the way through to completion of the works and handing back the asset to its relevant owner. It also includes a defect liability period from your amp, between your AMP 17 and 18. And really what we've seen is not many major programs of this size hand back successfully, um, but for the Transpennine route upgrade for the west of Leeds, so Manchester to Leeds, um, we have 15 health and safety files in total. And to date, we've successfully handed, submitted three to NRG, which is a huge achievement for this for a project of this size and something we're really proud of. The process uh, to do with AMP supports handback in that make sure we've got all the AMPs signed off, communicated, handed back to the asset owner. That links in with the health and safety file submissions to NRG and reduces uncertainty for future projects. Successful handback means there's better records with NRG, better maintenance for the infrastructure for the future. And like it said, Sarah said, it links back to that point of maintaining quality and making sure that infrastructure stays for as long as it has done already and is safe for future years. Um, I'll pass back to Sarah. Thank you. 
Um, okay, so I suppose the question is, as an integration team, does it really work? Do we add value? And um, um, the simple answer is yes. Uh, we know that through feedback and we know that through outputs as well. So <clears throat> how do we make it work? Um, and that is, the, again, these are a few of them I could go on all day. Um, lessons learned. So everyone's favourite topic, I'm sure. We write them down, we put them in a big report. The report's 200 pages long and no one ever reads it again. Well, that doesn't really do it for me. That's that's not how it should work. We changed it, we revamped it. We do have a report, it's streamlined. And on the back of it, we've got a load of case studies that you can see on the right hand side. I know they're too small to read, but you can see on the right hand side, these are one pages that we can print out and put into the cabins and everyone on site can see them. They can go around the office, they've been on the screens and, and so on and so forth. It makes it easier to digest the information. It's quick, it's snappy. What was the problem? What did we do and how can we fix it next time? Who do we need to speak to to get it right? So the information is on there and if there's a standard that's applicable, that's on there too. So it's trying to make things more accessible. The one way that we do make sure these are migrated is the team that was um, is now the team that is. So basically the original project, um, the team over there. So say I used to be on W1, AIM used to be there with me. We've now migrated over to the next part of the project while they're on closeout. And that means we can take those lessons and we can proactively put them in place we can better um everything that we've ever done we can take those best practices and we can improve on them still there is another member of our project our original project team that sat on the furthest point of the project as well so we we are spreading um the people around who have got delivery experience and the experience of what needs to be passed down and where we really have got best practice that we can take advantage of and then the other thing is um, certainly in my team and around me and the way I feel is people are empowered to make change. If it doesn't work, fix it. If it does work, let's keep it how it is. We can always better something, but we've got to make sure that we're not we're not making too much change that, that's not going to add a positive. So if it doesn't work, we will change it. We will improve best practices or put them in place. The construction staging meeting, we were asked to put them in on this side. We did. It's made a massive improvement. Um, and, and it's certainly a best practice approach for me. Um, case studies, as I've just mentioned, the best practice, we're going to use them going forward because I don't want to wait till the end of a project to do a massive lessons learned. We did two days for Staley Bridge um, of lessons learning with, with everybody, I think. Um, we want these to be a rolling theme so we can do a case study approach. It's a one page. Every time we do something or we learn something, we can write it up, we can get it out. Uh, we just get signed off from the, the usual people and that becomes a catalogue that we can use and, and stick out whatever is relevant at the time. Um, that's the approach we're trying to take and it's something we're trying to push forward now. Um, and like I said, it, behaviourally, individuals are relating back to best practice. Um, Tom mentioned one the other day to me, you know, people are going back to, actually, we did that really well. Can we do it again? Actually, it might not work fully over here. Not everything's a lift and shift, but can we take the little nuggets from it and apply the principles and, and then build something bigger and better that works on the current project? So that is how we are implementing lessons learned and how that adds to assurance. And that is throughout. It's not just from the integration team. We also have the assurance team, which is our engineering fraternity, who do the technical assurance in what we do. Um, holding people to account. So. Alliance is, is quite a, an unusual thing and it's it's not pseudo alliance, it is a fully contracted alliance um, with the DA, DFT and we are all bound by our KPIs, our measures, the constraints, everything that we've put in that piece of paper that says we're going to do what we're going to do. Um, but as an alliance, sometimes people think you can't hold someone to account because it's seen as being clienty or pushy or you're not following the charter. Um, values and behaviours that are within it but ultimately you've got a job to do we're all we're all here to do it and I fully expect someone to hold me to account to my actions and what I'd say I'd do so it's about doing that in the right way the healthy challenge um, and, and as the next point says engagement with and not against the teams it's we, we've got to get there together and it is about helping so people need help they need to hold the hand up our team is here to help um, whilst we're not technical experts in in some areas, what we can do is offer a lot of support. We know the right people to go to. We can break down barriers. We have got the the communication stakeholder skills that will get us to that end point, um, and, and we do achieve as well. 
um, and encouraging challenge to drive diversity in force. So again, thinking outside the box, we had a, an instance just this morning where we need to utilise car park in a in a retail park and the answer was close down the shop and we'll just do that because the turn's too severe to take a right out of a left-hand turn. I was like, right, okay. Well, can't we just do that instead? Can we not just change the entrance and the exit? Can we not put the... Um, can we not change the service entrance? There's a drop in the hedge line there. That's low enough. Can we not just put a temporary entrance in there and change the curb line? These, yes, require design, but they're simple solutions to what is a seemingly big problem to, to close a retailer down for an extended period of time. So it's just thinking beyond what's in front of you. It's just a different perspective. Um, the entry into service leads, as I mentioned before, again, we have things in place. Um, they work and they add value. It is proven to work because we've carried it over and we've implemented it again um, as per request. Uh, and the insurance team, so again, the engineering assurance team that says are embedded within the process. So not there to check what comes and lands on their desk and goes, hey, we've got a design. Can you check it off and sign it so we can uh, go and build it? They're integrated into that process. They are exactly that. They're part of it and they run through everything. So IDRs, IDCs, absolutely everything. Um, and my team will go to those as well, just to make sure that we're picking up on the bits we can help with. So land access, consents, all the things you need to get to site, we can help with that and, and we can manage that process through. Uh, human factors in the project from start to end. So our team is, uh, and this is from a software approach, not human factors in a technical <laughs> sense. Um, our team is the constant. So we're here from concept to completion. Um, so we will see the design team ramp up, ramp down, as will the delivery team um, and various other ones as well. So we are here to the bitter end and we've been here from the start. So so we help again with the transition um, and just make sure the flow of information is there and we've got continuity in the team. Um, so digital innovation. Again, we I remember the first 2021 we had closure for uh, 16 days and we were doing it on teams i don't know how but we were doing it on teams um, and we've since evolved through using every file so every file of on awards and uh, they've got posts on linkedin you can see what they're doing and um, but we've evolved our reporting system to get it to the right standard we've set a standard and all we can do now is either maintain or better it it does evolve it does change um, and we are trying to be innovative in what we're doing and, and making that step change to digital innovation on site as well as in the office. So, again, a very, very real example of where we've we've continued to evolve something and we continue to do so. Um, and the health and safety file, again, Amy mentioned this before, we've submitted three out of 15 to date. Uh, it is something we're really proud of. There aren't 15 that we can submit right now. I just like to make that clear. There's about four that we can submit right now. Um, the fourth one is in progress uh, and the fifth one will, will not be too far behind it, which will be the electrification we've just done to Staley Bridge. Um, but again, we've bolstered the resource. We've put a closeout team in place. We don't want to be another major programme who doesn't hand anything back. We want to hand it back. We want to make sure that we're issuing um, those, those good and positive messages out there. And, and what does success look like? So there's there's two options here, Tom. I've got a video link on the bottom of that blue bar, or I've got some stats and pictures in the following slides. So it's it's up to you which one you want to go with because you're the guiding compass on this one. Should we try the video link, which will have no sound, but will be good? Let's go with pictures and stats. <laughs> <laughs> if I can share a video sound, I have put it open. I've, I've got it there if, we, if you want me to play it. If you've got sound, let's let's give it a go. Pitch paints a thousand words, doesn't it? Uh, I should have been prepared. I will, I will answer this question whilst you're... Um, <laughs> Have you done it? I think I've done there it. There you go. You can't hear anything. Okay. 
Okay, no sound. But as you can see, um, so this is the blockade that we did. We worked towards this for a period of time. Uh, Alison was the project director at the time. She's now our delivery director for the next day of the project. And what she's saying there is we're really, really good. We're awesome. We did a great job. Um, we use multiple kiros, as you can see. And it's, it's a long time to have a block. And I know people have had three months and six months blockades, but ultimately they become a BAE process. This was we had a period of time to deliver a quantum of work um, and we needed to be very specific in what we were doing. It was a constrained site in the sense that it, it wasn't long. Some of our sites are eight miles long. And whilst the possession was long, the actual work area, the work site itself was quite small. Everyone's layered on top of each other um, like a lasagna. So it became quite hard to make sure that everyone could work in that environment quite safely. So the deconfliction, those construction staging meetings were absolutely key in making sure this could happen safely. There was a lot of moving parts in this puzzle. Um, we did, we weren't naive enough to think that we would not need a replan throughout this works. Um, and we did. We just didn't know what would cause it or, or when it would occur. And on day one, before we took possession, we were about to, um, it was snowing. In early March, it was snowing. We then had sleet. We had minus six temperatures. We had wind, rain, sunshine. We had every season on this blockade, which, again, was a battle in its own right. So going into it, we were planning for summer and for winter because we just really weren't sure. And it turns out we did the right thing in doing that. Um, to be completely honest, we did need a replan. Uh, we needed a replan quite early on, and that was due to a series of unfortunate events. So we had a few failures on the machines, and you can plan and plan and plan. Um, and at the end of the day, you can still get caught out. So we sent all the machines off to make sure they'd been maintained. We um, unloaded wagons within SCO's yard to send them for their maintenance checks. We made sure nothing was undergoing maintenance during this period of time and everything was checked. Uh, we had two hy hydraulic hoses burst. Um, they don't give you any warning, they just go. And one was on a Kirov, which was a pretty hefty hose. Um, it took some doing to get it on and off. So that in itself was a, was a bit peculiar. Um, and then again, multiple machine failures. You can do all the checks in the world. It still happens. We did replan. We did get over it, um, as in the hurdle, not, not emotionally. <laughs> and the team did brilliantly. But I have to say, the construction stage in meetings that were undertaken to give the team that holistic view, understanding each other's constraints, what they did and didn't need to do at certain points in time and where they needed to be, helped hugely. If it was not for that, they would not have been able to have replanned that successfully in the short amount of time that they did. And again, having our SEO colleagues on board to help replan that haulage requirement and help go through that was an absolute success. So I think it was difficult, it was challenging, but it just goes to show that that, that integration piece, had we not have done that, we would not have been in such a strong position to replan. And today they're asking for it again. We're about to go into a series of weekends from next weekend with a 10 day blockade on the, with a number of weekends to follow ready into next year's delivery where we hit a 30 day blockade. So I feel like the team is there, we're ready. We just need to continue this good practice with the newer members of the team and make sure we, we embed what we've done um, and continue to grow on it. These are some stats uh, from the delivery and there's some pictures. Um, everyone likes picture rather than a wordy slide. Um, and you can just see everything that the, the guys achieved. Um, but that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Thomas, Amy and Sarah. That, that I thought was really good, really interesting. I think probably everyone accepts that, you know, really great innovation and improvement comes from these major projects. It's always really good to hear about them. Um, and I've seen in the corner of my eye lots of lots of questions popping up and down. So if I just scroll right to the top there. Um, there's a question from from Dominic. I don't know if Dominic's on and wants to ask the question. Come off mute. Are you still there? Hi, Dominic. Hi, uh, yeah, so um, 
Yeah, so I, th I think the question's fairly sort of um, sort of self-explanatory. Um, we have a, you know, no doubt your 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 intent of uh, compiling health and safety files progressively is is due to um, a lot of other things, you know, carment and yeah. uh, other yeah. issues, other issues around uh, poor health and safety file management within the railway industry in general. Um, but are you applying the same sort of uh, progressive uh, compiling of evidence principles to the health, to, to the technical files for your um, authorizations? Okay. Are you going to remind me? I will try. I will try and answer. <laughs> so, so um, they are subject to a different standard. They are. Um, so, but but, the, but the, 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 the the two the two um, the two are, are broadly similar in the fact yes, that yeah, they demonstrate yeah. uh, compliance to uh, legislation um, and and demonstrate um, evidence of of construction compliance. I think the the um, the the difficulty that we saw with the progressive compilation of the health and safety files was. In a lot to a large extent, we it was not progressively being done to verify quality in the meaningful mm -hmm. way. So the, the the essentially the the way that we're handing back the health and safety file is that we are offering attributes to documentation as a confirmation that the person that's had their quads is in a position to say that that record is right, and we're using that as a mechanism. And sometimes that mechanism fell down a little bit so that was where mm. that 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 kind of emphasis on the progressive compilation of health and safety file um and the records came from in terms of the mm. technical file and the records that go behind it the the i think there's 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 a, not an assumption because it's bad to assume but those happen intrinsically because we we pick those up in terms of um compliance audit so that that's one of the bits that we kind of pick up as in, in our cde so i don't think I would I would have to get back to you offline and the uh, you know the absolute assurance mechanism that we have got in place for it and I think that the the attention the rigor would have a similar level but it would be a process that was outside the site of the of the construction quality um, but I think it's a it's a good question it's definitely one that I'll go away and test and I think the team that deals with that might expect an audit soon. It's it's one that it's one that I feel you should um, certainly take. Or, or something that I feel you should take notice of because yeah, yeah. we have we have I'm I'm the system safety lead for Northwestern Central Region in yep. in uh, yep. not network mail okay yep. in uh, capital delivery um, and it is something we see time and time again where projects that are subject to um, authorization against interoperability which yep. uh, which this program of works will be um, it, it's something we see time and time again that they are unprepared um, when it comes to submitting their technical file to the ORI ahead of authorizations. And the two processes, like I said a moment ago, the two processes are broadly similar in the fact yeah, that yeah. you identify you identify what you need to do and you collate the evidence that supports uh, your compliance against those um, those requirements. OK, and there, but thereby that provides you with quality assurance that, that you have actually done the job correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, which you're obviously demonstrating on the health and safety file side, on the CDM side, um, but perhaps need to, to take that, um, that, that vision and apply it to the interoperability side of things. Or, or rather, assure yourself that it is being applied to the interoperability side of things. I can extend on that as well, if you like. So the, the CSM element, that interoperability side, sits under our team as well. Um, mm. So we work with our CSM colleagues. We have a, a dedicated resource or resources that sit underneath that banner. The technical file is produced in line with the health and safety file as well. It's within yeah. our common data area and project-wise. Um, so our authorization that's currently going ahead, um, we're currently about to start with the electrification. Um, our files etc for the or are already in primed for them to receive so it is something that is also built with our assurance team 
to our insurance team have their fingers in both pies if you like yeah, um, yeah. Just to make sure everything is ready and in a holistic view the entry into service stuff kind of takes into account all of these things as well um so our checklists are, and we do uh, we do amend things so whilst we stick to the standard we do add things in to make sure we're covering everything and, you, and you're quite right it, it does need to make sure it's in there and you say in capital delivery it doesn't happen i i come from the old ip renewals and not closing down projects it's it's so satisfying i don't know why people don't do it <laughs> yes <laughs> yes i know i know it, it's yeah I could get Thanks on this and be here all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> if we could just, uh, we, we just take one from the floor. We've got, uh, Alex has got, uh, got a hand up there. If we could just take that one. You there, Alex? Just on mute there. Classic. Sorry. Um, my, my, uh, my uh, speaker was, was my microphone was on mute. So um, yes, hello everybody. Uh, all I wanted to check is on a on accountability, which I really liked. I think it's a great idea. Um, well, how does it really look in real life? You know, I mean, it, it's it's great, and I agree. It has to be. We all have to be held accountable for what we do, myself included. <laughs> so, but what what does it really look like? What is the what 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 does it look like on you specifically and on your project specifically? In holding people to account. Yes. How how do you hold people to account? That's it. You got it, Sarah. Well, I don't stand behind them with a big stick. <laughs> I didn't um, expect it. <laughs> so it it's it's that engagement and that relationship building for me. It's it's got to be there if you just bark orders it's not going to happen we have a robust escalation process um, and we have various forums where we need to raise things and if they are not raised it gets escalated higher so we have a control board meeting and um, there twice period again it's a new addition from lessons learned we've got nine stages to get through there's two billion pounds worth of funding we're about to apply for so we need to make sure that the control around it is robust so the if you do not do what we need to happen, the likelihood is it implement it's it's going to result in a change. That change is is following a stringent process, um, and you need to justify it. If we don't justify that change sufficiently enough, again, there's usually a cost implication. We go into pain, which is not what people want. If there's KPI attached to it, we fail a KPI. There are bigger consequences than that person hasn't done a thing. Because again, we are still an alliance. We are a team be we that haven't achieved so my team tend to help a lot where we can whilst we can't help with the technical stuff we can help with other things and we do um but it, it depends on the example it's really hard to try and surmise that into yeah, one no, no, that's fine. Brief that like... description sorry sarah i spoke over you over there no, uh, no, that's not... that, how does that look <laughs> in relation to the sort of contractual arrangement so do you i, I assume Rightfully or wrongly, you've got a sort of NEC three contract or NEC four or sort of that form of contract. Well, we're about to enter into a new one, so I'll let you know right. when we get it. <laughs> we're about That's to fine. submit. Oh, yeah, please do, please yeah. do. Um, may maybe I can get onto that. Um, so <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Um. So, but what? So that that explains the supply chain, which is perfect. I understand that. What about the internal accountability? So you've got obviously members in your team. You said you don't stay behind them with a sort of stick which you shouldn't anyway I, I truly believe that um but what is what is the sort of mechanism then how do you motivate well i guess it get, goes back to sort of softer skills but also um accountable in the sense of you know you've done something um you're not going to lose your job over it but how do we make sure you don't do that again how does so that work me, in your team? For me, sorry um, personally, in my team, it comes down to uh, capabil capability modelling. So I need my team to be capable in what they do. And me barking at them is not going to achieve that. So I ultimately assess them on their own merit. A lot of this will come down to reviews as well. So it will be in their PDRs. So in our 
PDRs, my network rail team will have a set of alliance objectives alongside the network rail objectives. And again, we can tweak and modify them to be less generic uh, and more personable based on what I'm wanting them to achieve in the year. Um, so I've got two SPMs working towards red sites at the minute. They've both got very different angles in which they're doing it because they're looking at different things. I've got one looking at a 10-day blockade and I've got one looking at a run of 14 weekends. So their approach is very different and the expectation is very different because of the way they need to handle that piece of work as well. So it's monitored through their reviews and their one-to-ones, but it's also monitored through the performance. So all of our KPIs that are attached to it, the control board measures, the program, you know, the program should be our absolute mechanism for delivery. It shouldn't, it's not used as a reporting tool. It should be used to deliver a, a project. That's why we built it, to make sure we can do it. Um, so all of these things are things that I take into account. And again, it's that individuality. If you don't assess someone on their capability, you are never going to improve them as a as a key player for a high performing team. I agree. No, I completely agree. And thank you, Sarah. That's um, that's that's excellent. And I guess one thing I would sort of say from my own my own side is probably want to look into training. I'm sure you are anyway, just to, to, to put it out there, sort of make sure that the people get the right training because we're not Absolutely. all all the best <laughs> what well, we do necessarily but we can be with the right mentality perfect no that's it for me I'll, I'll be quiet now thank you very much for your time there's alex um just conscious of time there i see we're starting to lose people for other meetings and things like that and i think if we sat here for the rest of the afternoon we probably won't get through all the questions which just goes to show that what a really great presentation and how thought provoking it's been um, but what i would encourage people to do if, if you've still got questions things you want to discuss is go over to the PWI LinkedIn page. I think there's going to be a dedicated post um, as regards this presentation and, and sort of get involved in the conversation there. Um, so again, from me, thank you to the speakers. That was fantastic, really, really good. And just a, just a last reminder that there are a couple of more Lunch and Learns coming up. Um, the 20th of Feb is the University of Southampton Rail Trap Beds that I mentioned. And on the 5th of March, there's one from Great Western Electrification. Why are the masks so big? Um, which I really want to know the answer to now. So um, we'll be on to that one. But but thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Thomas. <laughs> thanks, Amy. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.